A couple of days ago, we did some live testing on the gravity flyer. Now, please understand I had barely had my Tesla coil ready to go, and we're just putting it in the system for the first time. Since then, I've been able to put this thing together and actually align everything. So, let's take a look at this a little closer. At the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you're seeing the two waves. On the top, you're seeing the Tesla coil. On the bottom, you're seeing the gravity flyer. So what's going on here? Both of them are in phase now. So what does that mean? It basically just means that we align both of them together. They're both pulsing at the same exact time. So I want to show you this picture here because it's going to illustrate the point. You see them jumping all over the place. Well, the gravity flyer itself is shaking a little bit. So the signal kind of bounces all over the board. So let's go ahead and show you the alignment. As you can see, both signals are completely overlapping each other. They are completely in sync, or what I would call in phase with each other. Now, this is exactly the point where we need to be. If you haven't noticed already, our gravity flyer is matching our Tesla coil perfectly. The signals are the same. They have a point where they build up energy and then discharge it. They're doing the same exact thing. So... Where are we going to need to push the button and get the amplification? Let me just show you real quick what the amplification looks like when you push the button. Now this part right here was taken while they were out of phase, but it still shows you the amplification. You see the line there where they both are, and then you see how much it's amplifying the wave. Now, imagine if they were both in alignment at that point when I pushed that button. That means that that giant amplification right there would hit both of them simultaneously at the same time and it would make it jump. That's what we're looking for here. So let's go back to the part where they're in phase because I want to focus on this. At the top you see the Tesla coil, on the bottom you see the gravity flyer. That's pretty clear. What I did was I drew a red line here and show you where the max power is. That is the exact spot that I want that button pushed. That is where it's going to discharge out and it's going to give us the max amount of power. That's where the button has to be pushed. So it's timing at this point. We can time exactly where that button gets pushed to hit at the top of these waves. You don't want to hit it in the middle. You don't want to hit it in the beginning where it's not amplified yet. You want it right at the top of this wave. That's the key component here. So having an oscilloscope set up to see this is going to make this whole process a lot easier. Let's take a look at the oscilloscope when we just have our Tesla coil connected. I want you to understand the two different waves here. One, the yellow wave right there is the signal that we're getting from our Tesla coil telling us that we are in oscillation. The second signal on there is the buildup wave. It's a discharge wave. So, as the energy goes from small to big, it builds up, builds up, builds up, and then discharges. Now, in our gravity flyer, we're not having a discharge. We're in cold energy because we're using a DC circuit. This particular picture shows it in an AC circuit where you get sparks coming out of the top. Not what we're looking for. However, the waves on the oscilloscope are the same. It's going to slowly build up until it explodes at the end, and then you get a massive discharge. This is exactly what we're looking for in our gravity flyer. We saw our signals align. Now we're seeing what it does. It's going to discharge a max amount of energy. Let's go ahead and take a look at these signals again. The top is our Tesla coil. The bottom is our gravity flyer. The top is consistent to build up and discharge, build up and discharge. It's in a timing run. The bottom one is not. Our gravity flyer sometimes puts off a charge that is very small. Then it goes to the amplified charge that we want. You have to be mindful of this when pushing the button. Now I went ahead and marked it here for you so we can all clearly see it. You can see that wave is not up to snuff. It's not good. It's just bad. It's, it's not what you want. If you push the button on that, you're not going to get anything. You have to wait until the line's properly and push the button there. That's why the oscilloscope is so important. 
It's why Alexi sometimes hits it and sometimes misses it, or sometimes catches it before it hits max power. This is the understanding here, guys. This is what we're up against. We have to time this based on where it falls in the oscilloscope. So what's the greatest advantage to having this thing connected this way? Well, we can now predict when we push the button. We see the buildup. We should know by doing this several times when you push the button where you're at in the signal itself. And then we can predict exactly when to hit it. This is not going to be a shot in the dark. This is going to be a bullseye, guys. This is one of those things just going to take some time to tune it correctly, put it in the right phase, and then be able to time the button push. We can see everything now. There is no more mystery about this button push. We know why it's happening, and now we know the effect. We're getting a massive discharge of energy as soon as that button's hit. It's clear on the oscilloscope, and now we can predict it. Now we can do it. When we talk about the button push, this is what we're talking about. Here's the ultrasound device here. You see the button on the right and the dial on the left. As you push the button on the right, you're going to get the amplification part. Now, on the left, you have, still have to line up the frequency. So, how do you know which range to put it in? The greatest thing about Alexi's device is he did it so that you can hear sounds from it. So, as you move this dial, it's going to go click. And then you move it to the other side, go clink. You get both of those sounds. Now, one is stronger than the other, so you put it towards a strong one. Generally, I found it's towards the bottom side. What you're doing is setting the parameter of your ultrasound. You're getting it set so that when you hit it, it goes max power on the ultrasound device. If you do it at the weaker side, you will not get as heavy of a push on the button. What does that mean, heavy push? It basically means that piezo buzzer is not going to pop as hard. It's not going to force power into the center disc. You won't change the octave if you're in the wrong area on this. This is basically amplification. This whole ultrasound device is an amplification to the circuit. That's all you have to understand about it. It is where you set that dial is exactly how much amplification amplification you're getting just think of it as a volume dial you're setting the volume to max then you're pushing the button it's the simplest way to ever think about this this right here is the triggering of the ultrasound piezo buzzer it's gonna pop it's gonna just make a distinct sound but what it's doing is it's putting a pressure wave to the center plate and it's changing the octave in the center plate or changing the tune of the singer so basically, you're just getting this thing in tune so it lines up. Let me show you what I mean uh, with some pictures. This is what we're looking at. We are right here in this picture 180 degrees out of phase. So what does that mean? We have to tune the singer or change the octave. We need to move that signal over top of the other one. Now pushing that button should align it to do it. I personally prefer tapping the center plate in order to put it in alignment before you get to this point. It just makes it a lot easier for the button push to be able to tap the plate, set the alignment, and then go from there. Alexi does it this way. He sees the signal, it's completely out of tune, then he pushes the button to get it in tune, so with it, when he hits it the last time, it's at the amplification point. I'm going to play the audio on this so that you can hear the piezo buzzer popping on this so that you know what I'm talking about. I wanted to address the megahertz frequency in this machine. Why are we not looking for kilohertz? Why are we looking for megahertz? Well, we want the maximum possible value that we can get out of the frequency. That way when we amplify it, it gives us the highest amount of energy possible. 
26 point whatever megahertz is exactly what we're looking at. That's the most consistent between the Tesla coil and the gravity flyer. Hitting that at the amplification level makes it really a lot of power. So what do I mean when I say a lot of power? We're looking at EMF, electromagnetic frequency in the air. We are going to blast this thing with a massive amount of it. It will kill all the electronics near it. So, this is going to be one of those tests that you're going to have to do outside. I am thankful that I did not push the button at max power during live testing because it would have blew out my computer and everything in my garage. Now, it's a big, big thing. If it can knock out a space heater for Alexi, then it can knock out a lot of stuff in your garage. Again, we're not looking to play with the little power here. We're looking to play with the big power. This is the massive buildup you get in a Tesla coil before it sparks. Then it, you see all the sparks coming out of it. I can put 11 inch sparks out of my Tesla coil based on what I'm doing with my ZVS circuit. Now, because we're using DC and understand this, it is DC. It's a ZVS. We are pushing not the sparks but we're pushing the amount of resonance through this coil. It's a resonance coil, so it's cold energy. There is no spark and discharge from the Tesla coil. It's all cold energy into the center plate. That means one giant, it's like a big uh, EMP going off in your garage. It's just electromagnetic frequency instead of an EMP, but the effect is the same. It starts killing things that are electronically activated in your area. So just understand this. I got to move my cars out of my driveway. I got to do everything else, take precautions, because it's going to hit like a hammer. Now I wanted to address another thing that has to do with the Tesla coil. We talk about feedback in the Tesla coil. So why did I build the Tesla coil that I did? I need you to understand. I needed to bypass the feedback. I want the max amount of power, but I don't want the feedback of my Tesla coil. I want it to stay running cool. Now, how do I do that? I make sure that my Tesla coil can nail that megahertz range. We saw the signals on our oscilloscope. We know that we're hitting them. We know that our buildup's the same. We know that the megahertz are there. That's not an issue with this Tesla coil. Again, Alexi's system is self-correcting. Everything corrects itself based on the frequency because the wire goes down the throat of the Tesla coil, changing some of the frequencies in the Tesla coil. It adds capacitance to the coil. So, because it works in tandem this way, normally this coil is right around 900 uh, kilohertz is where it runs at. When you put the gravity flyer wire down the Tesla coil, it runs around 300 kilohertz, 360, somewhere in there. The reason I did it this way is I'm already adjusted for the feedback. I've already put it in the cake, baked it in. It's already there. Now, all I have to do is push the button to hit the max power. That is the entire point of building my Tesla coil in this manner. I no longer have to use a complicated system with a Tesla coil to get the power that I want. The last thing I'm going to address here is the circuit itself. Now, this is a stock ZVS off the shelf. You can see we have regular capacitors in there. Stock ZVS, 1000 watts, works great. However, the capacitors are wrong for a Tesla coil. So we switched them out. The capacitors that I went to were 1.50 nanofarads each. So when you put them together in series, that makes 0.75 nanofarads. So what does that mean? It just basically means I went to a faster switching capacitor. That's it. Something that can run a, a Tesla coil with the ZVS where the other ones wouldn't. They would just heat up a circuit and that's not good. It pushed way too many amps, way too slowly. This moves them faster so that it can operate in a Tesla coil. This circuit is completely resilient to a lot of things. It will take 
power like no other. I have hit this thing with 80 volts of DC power. Not a problem. Doesn't even really get hot. As a matter of fact, in testing, I fried the wires right off of it because I wasn't oscillating properly on my number two coil. So, it can take it. It can take a pounding. The one thing you cannot do is touch this thing when it's in operation. You will start frying MOSFETs. It's because it's cold energy. You're bringing heat to a cold energy system. When you do that, you will take all of that heat and make all that cold energy go towards the heat. Therefore, if you're touching the back part of this where the actual MOSFETs are, you're just checking the heat on it, you're going to fry this circuit. Please, sit there with a little heat gun and look at the numbers. Do not touch this thing. It will work beautifully for you. It is, like I said, resilient as heck. If you saw my Tesla coil video where I walked around frying wires, you'll understand. Absolutely resilient circuit. Number one reason I wanted this thing in here was that. Number two, I can push a ton of power with this. Like I said, 80 volts. My last Tesla coil was 40 volts. And as soon as it hit any kind of back pressure on it, it blew out. That's why I went to this system. I don't need the back pressure anymore or the feedback in it. All I need to do is hit the button. That's the beauty of this circuit. It's also simple to put together. A switch to break the negative and then you hook up everything else. It's just DC. You can take your Variac, take a full bridge rectifier. You can even use a capacitor in the circuit if you want. And then just connect it directly to this and you're good to go. You're going to get a lot of radiant energy. Again, it's cold energy. I wanted to make sure I address this part before I end the video. Cold energy. What's the difference between that and hot energy? AC voltage through one of these Tesla coils give you hotter energy, big sparks, okay? When you put in DC to it, you get this right here. You get cold energy. You turn up the DC, what happens? You get the very smallest amount of breakout on the top, but you get a radiant energy. Therefore, you get a light that lights up further distances. This is what, 24 volts, 26 volts, and I'm getting four feet out of it. Understand this. When I put 80 volts to this, I'm getting well over 10 feet. That is a huge radiant energy. So it goes pretty far. If I set this up in my garage and ran it at that voltage, trust me, all my electronics around here would have a big, big problem. Not to mention, if you start amplifying that signal, oh my God, that is a massive amount of power. Just understand this. This circuit runs really, really well. And we're talking about cold energy. Therefore, cold energy, when you put the gravity flyer to this coil, what will happen? That little bit of breakout goes away. Why? Because you added more capacitance to the coil. There won't be any breakout on your Tesla coil. Understand this. That's a good thing. However, the radiant energy will be huge. Therefore, it'll be cold coming off. Why? Because it's pulling the energy into the gravity flyer. We saw the, the upper and lower plates pulling the energy into the center. This is the reason for it. It's cold energy. It pulls the energy towards it. It puts a load on it so that it draws the energy out. That's cold energy. Now, the last thing you want to do to cold energy is draw too much heat to it unless you're purposely doing it to make a massive spike. That's where we are in these coils. So, understanding this Tesla coil and why it's doing what it's doing under DC power is massively important to understanding what Alexi's doing. It has taken me a long time, a big deep dive into this to really understand it. We went from using a stock Slayer Exciter circuit to a ZVS with a massive amount of meaning. It doesn't mean that the circuit has to be complicated. It doesn't. We know it's a ZVS. It's not very complicated. The understanding is massively complicated. But if you take your time and go through it slowly, 
and just understand that it's a different energy than your average Tesla coil, then you're perfectly okay. You don't really need to know more than that unless you're trying to build it. Then you have to know all of it. If you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. Do all those fun things and have yourself a great day. Thank you.